and I attached an image of kind of a little flyer that has some of the basic information on it. I'll probably post a reminder sometime on Thursday so that everybody that's interested can have this information again. Today is the final week that we'll be covering new material for this class. Next week, since we're only doing one day of in-person class like this, I'm going to make it kind of a review day to briefly talk about everything that we've gone over this term to help get you guys ready for the final exam. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details of the final on Thursday. So today we're gonna jump fully into the realm of physics, which is a realm of science that deals entirely with motion and how things move and interact with moving things around them. And specifically today, we're gonna talk about some of the basic concepts behind physics, behind all the rules of how things move and how things interact with the world around them are these three basic laws of motion. So we'll talk about the first two today. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the third one and kind of do a review of all three. So the reason why they're called Newton's laws of motion this is not related to the Fig Newton, the tasty snack. This is Isaac Newton, represented in silly cartoon form right around here. Isaac Newton was a scientist and a mathematician in the mid 1600s, I believe. And he is considered by many scientists to be one of the smartest humans that has ever lived on Earth. He developed a whole new form of advanced math called calculus. He was the first person to put into words and writing the idea of gravity. So famously, it's not really a true story, but people like to say that he was sitting under an apple tree and an apple fell off and hit him on the head. And it hurt, but it also got him to start thinking about why is it that when the apple comes off the tree, it falls down to the ground and it doesn't just kind of float on the air. And so he was the guy that first started really writing about and first started coming up with con the concept of gravity. He also is one of the grandfathers of physics, specifically become he, because he came up with these three laws of motion. The law of inertia, F equals MA, and the action-reaction law. So these three laws of motion, as far as scientists have discovered so far, are universal laws, meaning that they are true no matter where you go in the universe. Any sort of particle or atom or matter follows these laws of motion. So today we're gonna talk about these first two right here. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the third one because it's a little bit tricky to understand at first. So when they're fully written out, the laws of motion probably don't make a ton of sense to you right off the bat. The first law says an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The second law says force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the third law says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Some of these words and some of this stuff you may have kind of heard of sort of before. A lot of it probably didn't make a whole lot of sense through the first time. And that is okay. Today, we're gonna break down this first law and talk about what all of these different little parts mean. And the second law talk exactly about how force, mass, and acceleration are related to each other. So Newton's first law 
of motion can be described in a couple different ways. You could say the velocity of an object will remain constant unless a net force acts on it, or an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion at constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Two different ways of saying essentially the same thing. But what exactly is that thing? What does all this gobbledygook in here actually mean? A couple things that I want to mention right off the bat. When we talk about an object at rest, we don't mean like somebody that's sleeping or lying down. Rest is a fancy physics way of saying something that is staying still. So like my laptop right now, I could pick it up and move it all around and shake it all about. But when I put it down on the table and take my hands off of it, my laptop is now at rest. It's not moving and it's not going everywhere. It's staying still. And in physics, when things stay still, we say that they are at rest. They are at rest. Constant velocity means moving at the same speed and direction. And we'll talk about unbalanced forces here in a little bit. But what does all this mean? Essentially, this is all just a very precise, fancy way of saying an object will keep doing what it was doing in the same direction at the same speed unless acted upon by some unbalanced outside force. So force is just a push or a pull on an object. So the first law says that if an object was sitting still, AKA at rest, it's gonna remain stationary. It's gonna remain sitting still. If an object was moving at a constant velocity, meaning it has a speed and direction and it's staying that way, it will keep moving. It'll keep going at that constant velocity. It takes some sort of force, some sort of push or pull in order to change the motion of an object. So the first law says that if my laptop is sitting still, it's going to keep sitting still forever unless some sort of outside force, like, I don't know, my hands, come along and start pushing it around. If nothing like that happens, if there's no sort of force on it, it's gonna stay still. Similarly, if something is moving, it's gonna keep moving until some other force acts on it. When you're in your car and you are going at a set constant speed, you have to push on the gas in order to go faster, or you have to push on the brake in order to go slower. You need to input some sort of other force on the car in order to get it to slow down or speed up. And that is what this first law is saying. If something's at rest, it's gonna stay that way. If something's moving, it's gonna stay that way until some sort of force comes along and acts on it. Some sort of unbalanced force exerts itself on the object, pushes or pulls the object in some way that makes it start moving or makes it stop moving or speeds up or slows down. So I keep saying force, an unbalanced force, but what exactly is an unbalanced force? How do you balance a push or a pull? What we mean by an unbalanced force is a force that is not resisted by an equal type of force, which is a bad way of explaining it, but luckily there's a pretty simple example. Like imagine my laptop computer or a textbook or like my water bottle right here. When I put my water bottle on the table, there are actually two forces that are currently acting on my water bottle. There's the force of gravity, which is pulling it down. It's cementing it to the table. It's not gonna just start floating off into the air. Gravity pulls it down. Everything on earth 
has the force of gravity on it at all times. Every person, place, thing, animal, plant, object, particle, they all have gravity pulling them downwards. However, the reason why my water bottle does not just fall immediately down to the floor is it's sitting on this table. And the table resists gravity. The table pushes back up on my water bottle or my computer or a textbook that's on the table. So even though gravity is pulling it down, the table is pushing up to hold it in place. These forces are balanced. The force of gravity pulling the book or the water bottle down is balanced. It's equalized by the table pushing up on the book or water bottle and keeping it in place. So these are balanced forces. So this book or my computer or my water bottle is not going to move. There's no other force acting on it. There's just the balance forces of gravity going down and the table going up. However, if, I don't know, say somebody was to come in from the side and push to the left, there's no other force on the left to balance it. So the book would move to the left. Or if I took my water bottle and pushed it to the left, it's going to move left because then there's an unbalanced force. So if the forces on an object, if the pushes and pulls are equal and opposite, meaning they're going opposite ways, but they're balanced out, they are balanced and there's no change in motion. If they are not equal and opposite, if there's an unequal force going in some direction, that's when they are unbalanced. So this water cup will keep sitting here for all time until somebody comes along and picks it up or moves it to either side. That is an unbalanced force, a force that does not have an equal opposite force counteracting it. So when things are sitting still or when things are moving, you're gonna keep doing that until some sort of outside unbalanced force acts on them. That is sort of the basic idea of the first law of motion. So I knew that I threw a lot at you guys just now with rest versus motion and forces and unbalanced forces. Does anybody have any questions so far about our first law of motion? Anybody a little bit confused, a little bit unclear on what our first law is about? No, sir. Oh, right. Sounds good. So we have our objects. They're either standing still or they're going in motion. There's one other thing that we can add on to our first law. It's also sometimes called the law of inertia. And inertia is Scientifically, it's the tendency of an object to resist changes in its state of motion. So objects don't want to just change their motion willy-nilly. It needs some initial force in order to get it to change. And what inertia says is that the more mass an object has, the more inertia that it has, meaning that heavier objects are harder to change their motion than lighter objects, less heavy ones. So inertia is completely dependent on mass. The more mass that you have, the more inertia that you have, and the harder it is to change your movement, right? Heavy things, it's harder to get them to start or get them to stop than smaller, lighter things. The more mass an object has, the heavier that an object is, the more inertia that it has. 
it's a lot easier to kick a little rock down the road than it is to kick a big boulder. That little rock has a small amount of inertia, so it's easy to get it in movement. That boulder has a large amount of inertia, so it's gonna be hard to get it to stop, start moving. You could also think of, say, tying a couple buckets up to a little stick up here. One of them is empty, and one of them is filled with sand. I don't know if you've ever carried a really big bucket that's full of sand before. Sand is a surprisingly dense material. So sand can get very heavy, even if you don't have that much of it. So this bucket has a lot more mass than our empty bucket over here. So inertia says that our sand bucket is going to be harder to push and get to swing in a big swing, right? This guy is pretty easy. You could probably do it with like one hand or one finger. Just give it a solid push and it'll start swinging back and forth. This guy is going to need a pretty big push if you want him to start swinging. Similarly, once they do get going, if you want this guy to stop and you, you just have to reach out your hands and hold on to it, and it's going to be pretty easy to get it to stop moving. You don't have to put in a lot of force to get it to stop. The sand bucket is probably going to hurt a little bit if you try and jump in front of it and get it to stop like with your hands or with your arms or something. It's going to have a lot of mumertia and it's going to take a lot of force in order to get it to slow down and stop swinging. So again, a pretty simple concept, a pretty basic idea. Things with more mass are harder to move, but we put it into a more kind of physics-based or science-based way. We say that they have inertia. And things with more inertia are more resistant to changing their motion. Same thing with our bowling ball and our tennis ball here. If they're rolling down the street, one of them, a tennis ball, you can stop pretty easily. You can probably just stick out your foot and catch it right on the edge of your toes. And it's gonna stop pretty fast because it does not have very much mass so it does not have much inertia. It's easy to change the speed of the tennis ball. Bowling ball is a different matter. If you stick out your leg in order to catch the bowling ball on your foot and slow it down, that could maybe break your toes or break your ankle. It's got a lot of inertia. It's gonna take a lot of force in order to slow that bowling ball down. You're probably gonna have to get behind it with like your whole body and catch onto it and slow it down. So more mass, means more inertia. More inertia means harder to change, harder to speed up, slow down, start and stop, or change direction. Same thing with if you have a dude running at you versus, I don't know, a fully grown African bull elephant. This guy probably weighs, I don't know, 180, 190 pounds maybe. Fully grown bull elephant could weigh, uh, let's say, maybe 1,900 pounds. So this guy comes charging at you. It probably, it might be a little bit tricky, but not too hard in order to make him move or cause him to stop or push him over. Elephant, you're going to have a little bit harder of a time. Once he gets up to steam, that's going to take a lot of force in order to get him to stop. So more mass, more inertia, more force needed to change speed or change direction. So if things have a large mass and therefore have a large amount of inertia, then A, if it's already moving, it's going to be harder to slow it down or speed it up. B, if it's at rest, if it's stopped, it's gonna be harder to get it to start moving. And C, the more mass it has, the harder it is to make it change direction. All right, that's why you see people playing tennis with the little rackets so they can hit the ball hard and change its direction really fast. If you try the same thing with the bowling ball, you're gonna have a hard time. That racket is gonna break before it changes the direction 
of the bowling ball. So the tricky thing about inertia and this first law of motion is that on Earth, there are all sorts of unbalanced forces that can slow stuff down, like gravity, for instance, that we already talked about. And we'll talk about some more of those in a little bit. But if you're out in space where there is no gravity and no other unbalanced forces acting on an object, then the first law says that if you have like a ball or a rock or something and you throw that rock and say you give it a pretty good heave, it leaves your arm going by 30 miles an hour. That rock is going to keep going 30 miles an hour until it comes into contact with like another planet or a star or an asteroid or something like that. But until some sort of outside force acts on it, that rock is going to keep going at the same speed in a straight line. So same direction, same speed. Because in space, we don't have many unbalanced forces. So until there is some sort of unbalanced outside force that acts on it, that rock is going to keep going same direction, same speed forever and ever and ever. The law of inertia is also why it is a good idea to wear your seatbelt when you're driving a car. Besides the fact that it's the actual law of the land and you could get a couple hundred buck ticket for not wearing your seatbelt. In our example picture up here, this man is a dumb person and he did not put on his seatbelt when he went to drive his nice blue sports car. So he's going along at 80 kilometers an hour, about, I don't know, 45-ish miles an hour. And then his car hits this brick wall. And the man goes flying. Why does the man go flying? Well, up till then, the man and the car are both traveling at 80 kilometers an hour. The car experiences a large outside force in the form of this brick wall here that causes the car to stop very quickly. However, the man who is traveling at 80 kilometers an hour does not experience that outside force. And because he's dumb and not wearing his seatbelt, he does not experience any force that causes him to change his direction. We'll say, for example, that he flies right over the uh, windshield. It's a super low to the ground, like fancy sports car one. So he goes right over it. So because he doesn't experience any outside force, the man is going to keep going at 80 miles, 80 kilometers an hour, right over the wall. So presumably something like, I don't know, say the asphalt on the ground causes him to stop his motion. So because of immersion, inertia, because he was in motion and didn't have an outside force to change his motion, he kept going, even though the car stopped. So this wall put a big force on the car to make it its motion stop. But the man did not have that force. He did not hit the wall himself, so he kept going. This is why seatbelts are such a huge deal and such an important part of car safety. If the man was wearing his seatbelt, then when the car hit the wall, the man would start to go forward, but then he would experience the outside force of his seatbelt pushing on his chest. And yeah, it might not feel good. It might give him some pretty bad bruises and maybe a cracked rib or two, but that's a lot better, I would say, than his face contacting the asphalt at 80 kilometers an hour. So inertia says that things in motion will resist changing their motion unless some outside force acts on them. The outside force acted on the car, but it did not act on the man. So his motion kept going until sometime later on down the line, where it's going to be stopped by a combination of gravity and the asphalt on the ground. Things in motion tend to stay in motion until an outside 
unbalanced force acts on them. Same thing with this example right here, a little bit more common kind of everyday example. This lady was doing some yard work, scooped up a whole bunch of leaves into her wheelbarrow and just put her rake right on top. Picks up the wheelbarrow, is going, and then all of a sudden, oop, the wheelbarrow hits a rock. So the wheelbarrow stops because the rock exerts a force on the wheelbarrow to make it stop. The lady stops because she's holding on to the wheelbarrow. So the rock exerts a force on the wheelbarrow, which exerts a force on the lady. But our rake right here has not felt any force yet. It's just sitting on top of the wheelbarrow. So when the wheelbarrow stops, it keeps going. There's no unbalanced force acting on the rake yet. So the rake flies off the top of the wheelbarrow onto the ground. Same concept as the guy in the sports car until this rake experiences an unbalanced force that changes its motion, it's gonna keep going in the direction it was going at the speed it was going. If it was going five miles an hour before the wheelbarrow stopped, it's gonna keep going five miles an hour after the wheelbarrow stopped. Again, the first law says that when you put a golf ball on a golf tee, if you don't touch it and there's no wind or anything that comes by and blows it over, that golf ball is gonna sit on the golf tee forever and ever and ever. There's no outside force that acts on it. It's not gonna move until you swing and hit it with your golf club or you pick it up and put it down somewhere else or the wind comes by and blows it over. So it needs some sort of unbalanced force to get it going. And then once it's in the air, the unbalanced force of gravity is gonna pull it down to the ground to hopefully land on the green close to the pin, close to the hole. So things at rest will stay at rest and objects in motion will stay in motion forever until an outside force acts on them. And so you might be thinking, well, okay, yeah, that is true. But what about if I just like roll a ball around the, um, on the ground? Or what if I'm on my bike and I start pedaling and then I stop? Eventually, I'm gonna slow down and stop on a flat plane, even if I didn't put on the brakes or anything like that. The reason why that ball will eventually stop rolling or the bike will eventually stop going is because when you're on earth, there's almost never a time that unbalanced forces are not acting on you. And the two most common unbalanced forces that change the motion of objects on earth are friction and gravity. Friction is a contact force. It's the force that happens when two things rub against each other. So you can feel friction if you put your hands together and rub them together pretty fast because the force of friction between them causes heat to build up between your hands. So your hands will get warm because of all the friction. The other force that causes things to change their motion on Earth is gravity that we've already talked about a little bit. If you throw a ball straight up into the air, it's not gonna keep going up and up and up forever. Gravity is immediately gonna start acting on it and it's gonna slow down, slow down, slow down until it starts reversing and speeding up down towards the ground. So gravity is preventing that ball from going at the same speed in a straight line because gravity is pulling it down unbalanced to the ground. Friction is why things that roll or slide around the ground will eventually stop because the friction between the two objects causes them to slow each other down. So there are a bunch of different types of friction that we're not gonna get too deep into today, so don't worry too much about them, but things like sliding, so like ice skating or pushing something along the ground, Rolling friction, 
So like balls or wheels, like on a bike or a car, there's friction between the wheel and the ground. Fluid friction, there's air resistance or water resistance if you're trying to move quickly through air or liquid. And then static friction, which is the friction that initially resists an object from moving. But again, the basic idea of friction is that it is an unbalanced force that causes objects to slow down. So that's why when you're sitting still on a bike, you're not moving. So you're at rest and you'll remain at rest until you start pedaling faster. So once you start pedaling, you're adding force to the bike, you're causing it to push along the ground and roll along. There's still friction behind, between the tire and the ground, but you're overcoming it with your pedaling. So you're speeding up as you apply extra force. So you pedal, 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 and then you stop and you coast for a little while. And if you're on flat ground, you'll coast and then you'll kind of slow down and eventually you'll come to a stop. And that's because the friction between your bike tires and the ground is causing that bike to eventually lose momentum, lose forward motion, and slow down and stop. It's overcoming the initial force that you put into it by pedaling. Same thing with if you're in the car and you're on the highway doing like 60, 65 miles an hour. And then if you lift your foot off of the gas and just coast for a little bit, you're pretty immediately gonna notice yourself slowing down, right? So in the first couple seconds, you'll probably drop from 65 down to like 55, 50 miles an hour. And that's because there's friction between your car and the air. So if you stick your hand out the window and you're driving fast, you can feel the air pushing against your hand, right? That air is also pushing against the car. So there's friction from the air and there's friction from the tires on the ground. So if you let go of the gas pedal, even without braking, you'll eventually slow down and come to a stop because of friction. I mean, so I guess in most cars, you won't actually stop because most cars have the thing where you'll in drive mode, you'll be going forward at like one or two miles an hour. But the same idea applies. You slow down and slow down and slow down because of friction with the air and friction with the ground. So even though it doesn't seem like it, there are still unbalanced forces acting on your bike or acting on the car that change your motion. This is why it was important in the earlier example of the astronaut throwing the rock in space to say that it was in space because in space, there is no gravity and there is no friction. So there's nothing to oppose the motion of the rock. Unlike here on Earth, where if something travels through the air, it's going to be pulled down by gravity. And if something slides along the ground, it's going to be slowed down by friction. So again, similarly to that rock example from earlier, if you're in a rocket ship and you exit Earth's atmosphere and Earth's orbit, and you make it out into deep space, until you adjust the thrusters or change your speed or direction, once you have a set speed, you're gonna be going in that direction and at that same speed forever. Once you go through the burn, you get up into space, and then even if you get up into space and you cut off all your engines, that rocket is gonna keep traveling at I don't know how fast rockets go, a thousand miles an hour through space, even if you don't do anything. And that's because of the first law of motion. Things in motion will stay in motion at the same velocity unless an outside force acts on them. In space, we don't have outside forces like gravity or friction. So until some force from the rocket or from a planet or asteroid or something like that affects it, it's going to keep going at the same speed in the same direction forever. All right. Anybody have any questions so far about 
First law of motion, inertia, friction, any of that good stuff that you've talked about so far. Any questions, comments, confusion, concerns, anything like that? No, sir. All right, cool, cool, cool. So first law of motion, things at rest will stay at rest and things in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an un outside unbalanced force. So things will keep doing what they're doing until an outside force acts on them. And inertia says that the heavier you are, the more force that's going to be needed in order to change your motion. There are some other stuff in the notes here about uh, momentum that we're not going to get to today because that's a whole different topic. I thought I took these out, but this must have been a earlier version that I accidentally linked to. So moving on to our second law of motion, which is the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. And luckily this guy is pretty simple. The second law just says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. F equals M A or M times A. Another simple equation, kind of like our density equation from earlier. So acceleration is how quickly an object is speeding up or slowing down or even changing direction. And so if you know how heavy something is, its mass, and you know how quickly it speeds up or slows down, you can calculate the force that was applied to it. So F equals m times a force equals mass times acceleration f equals m a weight times speeding up equals force push or pull amount so force and mass and force and acceleration whoops are what we call directly related or directly proportional, meaning that if one goes up, the other one has to go up as well. If one goes down, the other one has to go down as well. So again, the second law is a kind of scientific way of explaining some fairly straightforward ideas. So for example, if you are pushing a certain mass, like this big cart that has this little box on it, if you provide a certain amount of force, a certain amount of push on this cart, you'll get a certain amount of acceleration. It'll speed up to a certain speed. If the mass stays the same, you're pushing the exact same cart, but you push with more force, you'll get more acceleration, right? Because force and acceleration are directly proportional. If you push the same thing with more force, if you give it more oomph, it's gonna speed up, it's gonna go faster. It's gonna get to that final speed a lot quicker. So if the mass is the same, when force goes up, acceleration goes up. Similarly, if you want to get something the same amount of acceleration, but it gets heavier, you're going to have to put in more force. So for example, if you have a wagon that has a little, I never figured out what this is supposed to be. I call it like a little statue of something. So your wagon has a statue and you're pulling it. If it's got one statue on it, then you probably don't need to put a lot of force in it in order to pull it a certain acceleration. If the mass goes up, if you add on a whole bunch more statues onto the cart, 
you're going to have to put in a larger pull, a greater amount of force pulling on that little wagon in order to accelerate it. So again, if we want to accelerate it the same way, if the mass goes up, the force, the pull amount is going to have to go up as well. Again, makes sense. You probably experienced this in your life at some point. It's easier to pull something that is light versus something that is heavy. But now we're putting it into more specific, more kind of physics-based terms, relating it back to this idea of force, mass, and acceleration. So again, these three amounts are related to each other. And if you can figure out two of them, then you can figure out the third one. If you know how heavy that your wagon is, and you know how much acceleration you want it to achieve, you can easily calculate the amount of force that you're going to need in order to pull it up to that acceleration. So again, the force that an object experiences is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So if you have some soccer players that are out there kicking a ball around, they're constantly changing the movement of the ball, right? That ball is constantly having force applied to it. So its movement, its acceleration, its speed is always changing. It's never sitting still. It's never at rest. So if you, the mass of the ball is pretty easy to figure out. All you have to do is put it on a scale and weigh it. And the acceleration of the ball, you can figure out if you had somebody who had like one of those radar guns that like police use in order to find people that are speeding. If you train that on the ball and somebody kicks it really hard, you can follow the ball and use that to figure out its acceleration. So if you know the mass of the ball and you measure how quickly it accelerates after somebody kicks it, you can figure out the force of contact between the foot and the ball. So if you know how much it weighs and how quickly it speeds up, you can calculate how much force that the soccer player put in in order to kick the ball that quickly, that amount. So F equals M times A, the amount of force that is acted on something or the amount of force that one object exerts on another is equal to its mass times its acceleration. And again, acceleration can be speeding up or slowing down. If you want to calculate the amount of force that brakes impose on the wheels of a car, you can figure that out by the weight of the car times how quickly it slows down once you hit the brakes, once those brakes are applied. If you know those numbers, then you can figure out how much force was applied to the wheels in order to get them to slow down and stop when you hit the brakes. So the second law of motion, the second major thing that Isaac Newton figured out was this direct proportional relationship between the amount of force exerted on an object how heavy that object is, and how quickly that object speeds up or slows down to its final speed. All right, any questions about the second law of motion and how force and mass and acceleration are all related to each other? Right, sounds like everybody's okay with our first and second laws so far. So again, first law, things that are at rest are gonna stay that way, and things that are moving are gonna stay that way until some sort of outside unbalanced force comes and acts on them. When that happens, we can calculate the force that acted on them 
if we're able to figure out how much the object weighed and what its acceleration was, either speeding up or slowing down. If we can figure out those two numbers, we can do mass times acceleration, and that will give us the force. F equals MA, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So that is actually where we will stop for tonight. On Thursday, we'll get into the third law, the law of action and reaction. This one is a little bit tricky and requires a kind of going through a lot of examples to understand really well. And so I'll save it for Thursday to make sure that we have plenty of time to go over it and make sure that everybody feels good about it. We'll also use Thursday to kind of wrap up this laws of motion and talk about how they all work together to tell us about the motion of an object. So for this week, since we are getting up to the end of classes here, I just wanted to make sure, go over kind of the couple important points of the laws of motion for your assignments for today and tomorrow. So today's assignment is essentially to just put in your own words, what are, what is the first law of motion? So if you wanted to describe the first law of motion kind of in your own words or in your own way, what would you say best describes that first law of motion, that law of inertia? So that is Tuesday's assignment. And then Wednesdays, all I want you to do is tell me about that second law of motion equation. So what is the equation that represents how acceleration and force and mass are all related to each other. So that's all you have to do in order to answer the assignment that'll be posted on Wednesday. All right, and then again, like I said, on Thursday, when we come back together for our last Thursday IPC class, We'll talk about what that third law of motion is, what are some good examples, what does it mean, and we'll kind of tie all the laws of motion together. All right, does anybody have any final questions on the laws of motion, what they are, how that first and second law work, and what the assignments look like for the next couple days of IPC class. <laughs>